Recently, we designed SIA to be ASIC friendly. Um, and this was a controversial choice within the community. Um, ASIC resistance was very popular among altcoins. Uh, we developed SIA in 2014. Um, so, but even back then, ASIC resistance was very popular and believed by the mainstream to be the right way to develop an altcoin. Um, but we didn't receive too much of a challenge to this. It wasn't a focus for us uh, as a community early on because there were no ASICs. Uh, SIA's market cap was like $80,000 or something. Um, and so no, no ASICs were being developed for that and it just kind of got ignored for a while. Um, but our view was that even for ASIC resistant coins, the transition to ASICs is inevitable and that it's better to, that we, we thought that the jump from G GPUs to ASICs would be traumatic um, and we thought it's better to have a traumatic event early in the life of the coin rather than later in the life of the coin. Um, so we, we embraced an ASIC friendly algorithm with the intention of like getting through the trauma sooner rather than later. Um, so it was about 2017, uh, two years after launch, that SIA hit a market cap where it made sense to start developing ASICs. Um, at this point, Bitmain had proved in the Bitcoin world to be both dominant, um, and I say a bad actor, but they, they had started interfering with politics um, and being very active in a way that was highly controversial. Um, and so we didn't want that same situation for SIA. So we took it upon ourselves to make Obelisk, an ASIC manufacturing company, with our first product being a SIA miner, um, the goal to develop SIA, uh, ASICs for SIA before Bitmain, kind of corner the market early, um, the same way that Bitmain had in other coins. And since our market cap was just $20 million, if we were like rank 80 or something, um, we thought that we'd be under the radar. Um, so we kicked off Obelisk around May. Uh, we didn't tell the community, then we, we like, started to hint that we had a big announcement. Um, and our market cap jumped from 20 million to 600 million in about three weeks. So our like, surprise advantage just like melted um, and we were suddenly on the radar. Everybody was chattering about our coin and like, oh, 30X. Um, so we decided to move forward with Obelisk anyway and we just kind of prayed that 600 million was small enough that it's not interesting um, to someone like Bitmain. Um, Overall, the community was like sharply negative um, on Obelisk, um, and we suspected that it would be. Um, ASIC resistance was super popular. All of our GPU miners were pretty upset. Uh, but again, this was you know well before any ASICs existed, um, so it was, it was forecasted to the community months in advance that the transition was happening. Um, the GPU miners had time to move away um, instead of being instantly obsoleted, um, which we I think. You know, that is a good thing that that forecast existed. Um, so we, we found out much later, um, like a couple months ago, that within 24 hours of announcing our own ASIC project, uh, Bitmain kicked off their own SI ASICs, uh, basically as a direct response, uh, direct response, and what we interpret to be as like a move to deliberately crush a competitor. Uh, but we, we didn't know this, um, and we had no confirmation or even real suspicion that anyone was developing ASICs alongside Obelisk um, until it happened. So for July through January, the community got used to the idea of ASICs. Uh, most of the core members of the community uh, had actually bought an Obelisk miner, which meant um, a big part of the community, not just the developer team, had invested heavily into this like transparent community ASIC project. Um, and Obelisk was originally like very idealistic, we had rules about how much hash rate we would produce, that we would disclose it all, who we would sell it to, how we would you know, prevent one large miner from buying everything. Um, and so pe people grew comfortable with Obelisk. Um, and by our January batch, um, the community had put in more than $10 million um, into the Obelisk project, which was a lot for us. Um, There's yeah, more, more money than the dev teams ever had for sure. Um, so they're like, whether or not it was a good thing, the core community of SIA was heavily invested in this community ASIC project. Um, so January 17th, I woke up to like 50 notifications. Um, and I woke up early because my phone was just buzzing a ton. Um, and a lot of people were really upset. I had people threatening to sue if SIA hard forked um, to obsolete ASICs. Another group saying that they would sue if we didn't hard fork. Um, and I was like kind of confused and like what was going on 
Um, but overnight, uh, during the day China time, Bitmain had sold ASICs for Saya shipping in 10 days. Um, so we got a 10 day heads up that ASICs were gonna be on our network. Um, so their sale lasted about eight minutes and from analyzing the blockchain, uh, they were accepting Bitcoin Cash. And so looking at the addresses, we estimated that they'd sold about $20 million of Saya mining hardware in about eight minutes. Um, so Obelisk was still about five months away from shipping. Um, no notice to the developer team. And so the community was uh, in a lot of turmoil. Uh, so a lot of people realized that their investment into Obelisk had been threatened. And suddenly we were just like flooded, uh, like completely inundated with new accounts, people we didn't recognize, memes everywhere, posts, accusations of Obelisk being greedy. Um, one thing that's not in the slides is that we actually put into the SIA ASIC that we had made an extra circuit um, sort of as like a fail safe. The original idea, uh, so what the extra circuit is, is um, just like some unique, like you couldn't predict it, extension to the Blake 2B proof of work algorithm that would make it so that Psi ASICs could mine Blake 2B or like Blake 2B star and other ASICs would be unlikely to have predicted this Blake 2B star variant and would be unable to mine it efficiently. Um, so the goal of us doing that was not for this type of situation. It was the idea if that, you know, a Bitmain showed up and 51% attacked the network, um, or if, if something really bad happened, we had this fail safe where we could hard fork, get rid of some ASICs, not all of them. Um, and we actually encourage most ASIC manufacturers to do this just because uh, if you get really desperate, it's nice to have a tool that allows you to break some ASICs, but not all of them. Uh, but when we disclosed that we had this extra circuit, the community was like, oh, you have to use it, you have to fork, you have to get Bitmain off the network. Um, and actually, the, that we had added this circuit and that we told people that we had added this circuit ended up being, uh, it caused a lot more drama. I don't, think, I don't think people would have pressured us to hard fork as much as they did if they didn't know that we had the power to brick some ASICs, but not the community ASICs that we had developed. Um, yeah, so there, there's this like clear conflict of interest within the community. We had like no, no time to prepare. Um, and already like within, within two or three days, the first YouTubers were running Bitmain ASICs, making like $800 a day. Um, and so it was, it was uh, chaos. Um, the community split into like two big factions. Um, there was the SIA consensus group, which was a bunch of people who wanted to hard fork. Um, they made their own like secret discord um, and talked about you know, how, how to get through, how to like push a hard fork onto the rest of the community. Um, I would say that the core group of SIA, probably 75% of them were in the pro hard fork side. Um, and then there were another 25% that opposed the hard fork. Um, and several people just left, uh, several core community members just like before any decision had made were fed up with the drama. Um, they're like, oh, I told you so. And, and you know, other, other things like that, um, they disappeared. So we'd, we'd already sustained like, yeah, the, the community was in a complete mess following the announcement of the Bitmain A6 even before they'd started shipping. Um, so we had to make a decision, um, and I'll make an analogy. If, if miners were bodyguards, like Bitmain had done the equivalent, you know, we were training our own bodyguards, and Bitmain had done the equivalent of showing up and like killed all the bodyguards that we were training and feeding and housing and our friends or whatever. Um, and then they were demanding that we respect them as their new bodyguards. Um, so I like clearly was not very happy about this. Um, and I think most of the community, like 90 plus percent, agreed that Bitmain was unquestionably like a bad situation. Like we, we all wish that Bitmain hadn't showed up. Um, we didn't want it and that, it, that miners had been developed in secret without informing the dev team or giving the community a heads up just felt very dirty. Um, so I firmly believe the best outcome would have been the community in consensus, uh, all agreeing to push Bitmain out, do the hard fork. Uh, but we had a minority um, and not a small minority, we're talking like a third uh, of the community that actively opposed hard forking. Um, and so a, 
big thing was that Bitmain had already sold all the hardware. Um, so when we brick the ASICs, it's not Bitmain that takes the fall, it's these innocent bystanders, the Bitmain customers. Um, Bitmain did their whole pre-sale in eight minutes before we had any sort of chance to give a response or indicate that we might fork. And this uh, was a sticking point, not for me. Um, I didn't, I feel like if you buy something without, I don't know, like doing research or seeing if people want it, that's your own fault. Uh, but many of our community members did not feel this way. A lot of people came forward to me and were like, if you fork, I'm leaving. It's gonna tarnish size reputation. Uh, you've, you've like taken control, it's your coin, it's, it's centralized. You can't make a decision like that. Um, and so ultimately, we decided that even though we felt it was better to push Bitmain out, it was not better to tear the community in half. And I think it would have. Uh, I think there would be a Sia Classic, and the Sia Classic would be you know, probably 20 or 30% of the Sia community. Um, so we weren't, we weren't willing to put that rift in our community. We decided not to hard fork, which of course made a lot of people very upset. A lot of people left. We got threatened with a class action lawsuit. Um, that was never never delivered. Uh, one of our bigger purchasers came forward and actually got lawyers involved, so our lawyers went back and forth. Eventually we settled. Um, it cost a couple hundred thousand dollars. Um, but they were like, you know, you have a fiduciary responsibility to hard fork, to protect your customers. It's, you know, it's in your power to protect our return on investment. You have to hard fork to do it. Um, and we just didn't have time to battle that out in court. Uh, if we had gone to court, our miners would definitely be late, which would definitely have resulted in a class action for not delivering. Um, so we, we just settled. Um, but yeah, so it, would, it was stressful. Um, the governance strategy here is that people like blockchains because nobody controls them. Um, a developer making a controversial team, or sorry, a developer team making a controversial decision violates the idea that nobody controls the blockchain. I like Bitcoin because I can make assumptions about what it's gonna look like tomorrow or next week or a year from now. Um, and so if there's somebody out there who's willing to make decisions around the protocol that impacts what it looks like you know, a year from now, even if it's democratic, um, even if I end up, you know, if, if I have a risk of being in the minority um, and disagreeing with like a network-wide decision, um, that's, that's just not valuable to me. I'd rather be on a centralized system um, that has a bit more control. So I very strongly don't believe in pushing changes onto people, especially in the blockchain world, where the whole decentralization idea is that we get away from the changes. Um, so I think that in times of controversy, the right thing to do is always uh, to default to the status quo. You don't do anything with the single exception that if you think not, not taking action is going to result in the death of the coin, or like that, you know, if something incredibly serious happens by not making a decision, um, then it's justified. Um, but in our case, uh, allowing Bitmain to stay on the network was not yet an existential risk. There had been no 51% attack. There had been no signs that the, you know, the hosting or the renting would be affected, um, and it never was. Um, so to, to date on our network, the presence of ASICs has not impacted our like day-to-day -day operations of the storage platform. Um, so we felt like this, it's not an existential situation. There, we would like to take punitive action, um, but because it's gonna rip the community in half and because we support decentralization, we're gonna do nothing. Um, and, you know, it's, it's just buyer beware. It's your responsibility to understand what the risks are with any, any system you decide to participate in. Um, so I definitely stand behind that decision. I think that not forking was the right move given everything that happened. I wish that forking had been the right move and that we had been together, um, but we weren't. So uh, SIA today is two ASIC manufacturers, Bitmain and Nanosilicon. Um, the SIA hash rate's fully saturated, so we've looked at making you know, 14 nanometer, 10 nanometer mi uh, miners for SIA. We can't afford tape out. Um, so is likely to remain a two manufacturer blockchain until the block reward is higher, um, high enough to support another entrant. Uh, and that's, that's assuming the incumbents don't overproduce again, which really is on Bitmain um, for this time around. Uh, so what we would do differently, the, most of the problems in the community happened from like the surprise attack 
and we didn't, we hadn't talked about before as a community what we would do if secret ASICs popped up. Um, and so we weren't prepared. There were accusations of greed, and it, it was really emotional. Um, and so, you know, tons of posts and community split. And if we had talked about it, say, in like June when we kicked off Obelisk and we had developed a plan and decided ahead of time, uh, we wouldn't have had this like difficult battle. We could have all been content with whatever outcome we decided in June, not have to worry about conflicts of interest. Um, so I think, I think that was like our biggest mistake, was just not, not talking about it before it happened. Because um, after it happened, it was just too heated to have reasonable discussion. Um, so for small coins, if you embrace ASICs as a small coin, you're only going to get one to two manufacturers. Um, and the reason is, because you're small, there's just, tape outs are millions of dollars. There's not enough room for three manufacturers to get to market, or for four manufacturers to get to market. Um, and I emphasize small coins. So I actually don't think this is the case for Zcash. Zcash block reward is very high and can, can support uh, you know, a, a multitude of manufacturers getting to market. Um, so I don't think our experiences are quite the same uh, just due to the size of the chains. Um, but for small coins, the hash rate will generally be dominated by the first to market player. Um, especially if, if the first market player makes an, aggr an aggressive first production run. Um, so what we currently think is the best solution for small coins is to nominate a manufacturer, demand transparency, um, demand that everything they build is open source, and then sort of give them a, a monopoly, let them know the proof of work ahead of everyone else, and then you know if you're gonna end up with one player anyway, at least pick the player. Um, and that has obvious, like, obvious problems with it. It's not a great solution. Uh, but we think it's better than just letting, letting whoever, uh, like rolling the dice and letting the greediest manufacturer win. Um, the ultimate conclusion, though, is that there's no holy grail that we could find. Uh, manufacturing is, is going to be highly centralized, at least you know, for the foreseeable future, uh, just due to economies of scale. Because of economies of scale, this applies to CPUs, GPUs, and ASICs. Um, and I would also say that proactive defense is difficult. If you get a manufacturer you don't want or you get a like, centralized situation, um, you can do the Monero route and you can fork every time. Uh, Monero ended up with like three, you know, three offshoots the last time they forked, and that's going to keep happening. Every time you fork, you pay a big penalty in terms of community and like, momentum, and, and just you, di you disrupt yourself every time you fork. Um, and so it's not something I would advocate as a long-term strategy, uh, only as like an emergency measure. Um, and so the best thing that I think we can do as a coin community is protocol level uh, just design that minimizes the amount of power that a 51% attacker has, um, and then maximizes the alignment of the manufacturer or of the you know, centralized hash rate owner with the community, make sure that if they attack the community, they lose a lot of money. Um, thank you. And I'm going to invite up Hudson for Ethereum governance. Hey, everybody. Hi. All right. So I'm going to talk about Ethereum governance today. But first, let me introduce myself. Um, I've been involved in 